Department section is going to be Alex Smith, and the title is called Semi Classical State. Associated with isotropic subjects, isotropic efforts, a very important part of the context. Thank you, Victor. Um, well, thanks to the organizers for the invitation to speak at this very nice event. Um, yeah, so I will be talking really about semi-classical analysis, which is the subject of the 11th book of Gillen and Sperber. And, uh, <laughs> so it, this is joint work, the joint work with, with, with Victor and Zo Ching Wang, who's in the audience. Um, but um, I, I thought I would um, start with, um, well, this is the plan. I thought I thought I would start with generalities about semi-classical analysis, uh, and um, and because probably in, in this audience not everybody is familiar with these ideas, and then I will talk about Lagrangian wave functions. So these are these are H dependent H is Planck's constant uh, H bar dependent functions that are associated to uh, Lagrangians of manifolds, uh, and then that's that subject is more or less well established. Uh, and I will then <coughs> talk about how to extend that to isotropic wave functions. Um, the simple calculus is more complicated than in the Lagrangian case. It's quite a bit more complicated. And then I will um, try to sketch some applications. And if there is time, there will be a, a coda, which is not on the slides. We'll see. Anyway, so the starting point is simplectic manifold x omega. And so this is uh, a bit like at the beginning of Jonathan Weisman's talk yesterday. Um, I will I will take two cases. There will be two cases running throughout the talk. Um, X a cotangent bundle. Um, M is called a configuration space, and the um, the idea here is that X is then has a, a, a real polarization in, in the words of well um, geometric polarization, or perhaps more um, uh, more. More interestingly, for, for this audience, X a compact Taylor manifold, which means that X has a complex polarization, uh, in which case, if X is Taylor, we assume that its in symplectic form is integral, so that there is a um, holomorphic remission line bundle with curvature of the symplectic form. Uh, and this will be needed to um, talk about Hilbert spaces. So introduce Planck's constant, H bar. Uh, and uh, so Planck's constant is a constant. However, it's not a constant. It's a parameter. A parameter is a variable constant, I think, the definition of a parameter. So it will be a number that will be allowed to tend to 0. And the whole theory is asymptotic as h tends to 0. And it relates the quantum world with the, with the, simple, with the classical geometry of uh, the geometry of classical mechanics. So, the Hilbert spaces, so first of all, this, this polarization of the previous slide allows us to associate Hilbert spaces to the symplectic manifold. In case x is a cotangent bundle, the Hilbert space is L2m. And this could be the, the intrinsic Hilbert space of half densities. Um, for x scalar, then what, that, what one does is one takes powers of the holomorphic line bundle. Um, and the power is the reciprocal of Planck's constant. And then <coughs> one takes the L2 holomorphic sections of this. So this is a, uh, uh, an H-dependent Hilbert space. Um, and uh, the dimension grows. If x is compact for each k, the dimension is finite. But it grows uh, as a polynomial in k of degree n. And n is half the dimension of x. So we, we have these uh, Hilbert spaces associated to um, the polarizations that I mentioned last time uh, in the previous slide. Um, and those Hilbert spaces are necessary to um, talk about quantum states and observable. So a brief, um, a brief review of quantum mechanics, uh, uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. <coughs> um, so one has a Hilbert space. Uh, the so-called pure states are rays in the Hilbert space. So they are represented by H-dependent vectors, because we're doing semi-classics, uh, semi-classical analysis. H is uh, everything is H-dependent, uh, and these are called in the physical literature wave functions. Um, and uh, observables are self-adjoint operators, 
And <clears throat> so that means that this could be the energy or our angular momentum or whatever. For us, it will just be a self-adjoint operator in a certain class. And the expected value of observations is this. So if psi is a wave function representing the state of a vector, then if you perform the observation of A many, many times, on average, you get this number, um, which only depends on the ray through psi. Uh, and the evolution is given by Schrodinger's equation, which is here. So if A is the energy, you have IH bar partial H partial T equals A times psi H. I should point out that there are some manifolds like Euclidean space that have both, that can be thought of both cotangent bundles or the R, R2n cotangent bundle of R, but it's also um, Cn. So in that particular case, you have, to, you have both cases, and it turns out that it doesn't matter which one, which Hilbert space you, you use. It turns out that um, uh, there is something called the, the siegel warman transform that takes you from one to the other. And the idea somehow, in, in, as I understand it, is that the wave function itself has no physical meaning. Um, it, it's just a, a probability amplitude. It's a complex value function that uh, it enters through these observations that we have. So, um, yeah, so semi-classical analysis, which is, a, uh, I think, a very beautiful subject, is in a way the opposite arrow of quantization. Uh, when one, one wants to understand the relationships between quantum and classical mechanics, and I, I found uh, a way to have LaTeX make these nice wiggly arrows. Um, from quantum to classical is really the semi-classical limit. Uh, so one takes limits of quantum objects as h bar tends to 0. So I wrote an example from uh, spectral theory. If you have a Schrodinger operator, you would like to know the behavior of, say, the spectrum or eigenfunctions of this as h tends to 0. Uh, and the quantization goes the other way. Quantum objects also associated with symplectic objects. Uh, so for example, what is the quantum analog of a Lagrangian of manifold? Um, and so, well, I mean, it's, it's a little bit artificial. I mean, I don't know how to say this. This relationship really goes both ways. And um, it, it, it's been a source of what I think are many beautiful theorems. Um, so I, I want to, I mean, to talk a little bit more precisely about what kinds of uh, the setting that we're in, <clears throat> and start making connections with, uh, well, more, more geometric objects. So um, in each of the cases that we have, one has an algebra of H-dependent self-adjoint operators. It's not just any old self-adjoint operator, but we have special ones that um, are semi-classical observables. <clears throat> and the things to know about them is the first thing is that they have a symbol map so that each one of these operators, each one of these curly AHs, has a, a, a symbol which is a function on the manifold. Um, <clears throat> a quantization scheme would go the other way. You would like to associate to every function a particular operator in this algebra. Um, but in any case, I <coughs> just want to point out the existence of the so-called principal symbol. Uh, and uh, the, the main property is, well, I didn't write the, the, the zeroth property is that the symbol of the composition is the product of the symbols. Um, <clears throat> but the more refined of uh, next level uh, property is the symbol of the commutator. The symbol of the commutator, once you multiply by i over h bar, is the Poisson bracket of the symbols. Uh, and uh, another thing to say is that the algebra Ax is graded so that you can talk about the, the degree of a semi classical observable. <clears throat> and the rule, uh, so I, I'll try to show you how, how the grading goes in examples. But the thing to know is that multiplication by h has degree minus 1. Um, so in the cotangent bundle case, say L2 of Rn, which is, this is the case I, uh, well, I think it's fair to say that uh, there are many more papers in this setting than in the Kähler setting. Um, uh, so the, the, the starting point are operators on L2 of Rn, which are the, pos the position Qj, which is just multiplication by Xj, and the momentum, which is h over i partial partial Xj. And I want to emphasize that these are both, in this sense, zeroth order operators. See? So what you do when you have a, a differential operator with powers of h in them, to compute the symbol is you compute 
you look at this, at the, sorry, you compute the order, you look at the um, the order, the differential order, um, which is in the in the usual sense, and then and then the order in h bar. Remember, h bar is multiplication; it has order minus one. So qj has no h bars; it's just a zeroth order differential operator. But pj has at one de one derivative and one power of h. So pj in this sense is also order zero. They're both zero order. Uh, more generally, if you have in the, say, you know, 2 of Rn, if you have x and p a classical observable, uh, there's a corresponding operator that looks like this. You simply try to replace x's by q's and, and partial derivatives by p's. And of course, there are ordering issues. And uh, well, in Rn, one has the wonderful vital quantization that uh, is the best of them all. But anyways, it, it, we're, I'm only, in any way, I, we're only interested in, I'm going to be talking about the principle principle level, principle symbol, at the top level, these ordering issues do not matter. The, uh, and so I will ignore that completely. Um, okay, so these are called so H sub differential operators. And uh, yeah, and so I, I repeat this already. I already said the thing about the degree. Yeah, so the Schrodinger operator, you see, has is of order zero. Both terms weigh equally, and uh, so when you take you take the leading, well, this is only a, you know both terms are, have order zero, and and the symbol of this includes the potential, because this part has an h squared, and therefore it's also order zero. Now I would like to emphasize the case when x is scalar. Um, so let's go back to, to assuming x is scalar. It could be a compact scalar, but we're assuming that there is a Hermitian polymorphic line bundle with curvature. And one still has an algebra now of so-called Bereshian Peplis operators. So it takes a, a, let me tell you how, how to define the prototypical Bereshian Peplis operator. <clears throat> Let's take a, a, a real function H. Now I'm talking about quantization. Uh, and I would like to associate to this H an operator. So it's an H dependent, H bar dependent operator, so I have to give you one for each k. And the formula is right here. So I don't know if you can see. Uh, there is this big parentheses. And then inside is multiplication by h. Uh, I'll say it slowly. This is multiplication by h plus 1 over i covariant derivative with respect to the Hamilton field of h. This operator here inside is the operator the, uh, the, uh, that um, pre-quantization operator um, that um, realizes that the mapping from that maps a h to this operator is is uh, uh, is the best way one can uh, hope to quant to quantize the Poisson algebra. But um, uh, as, uh, if you apply to a holomorphic wave function, this in general will no longer be holomorphic. So the thing one does is one projects um, uh, by orthogonal projection which is, it sounds like a brutal thing to do, but in fact, it behaves very well asymptotically. So it, it, it's the pre-quantization operator followed by projection. I just have a question. Yeah. <laughs> this is my favorite operator, the constant. The one inside. The, cost, the one inside. The one, the constant. But yeah. many of our friends only use the multiplication. It's true, right. Um, so. Comment on that? Yeah, so uh, to, to leading order, it's the same thing. So for you, is there a reason to be choosing this over the ones that our friends do? Or is this <laughs> just the same for you? Well, if for the purposes of this I, talk, I, do, I do like this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, this is, of course, what is, so this, this is what, yeah, this is yeah. what nature says <laughs> you should consider yeah. for once you think about. Yeah, for me this is the most natural yeah. thing. But you know, yeah, if, you no, talk, I, if you talk to to Leonie, he would say, "Oh, this lacks some positivity condition that the other one has." Which yes, I that's also so, true. Yeah, but any comments? On that? Yeah, so let me let me comment a little bit. So it's a, it's a bit it's it's about this question of ordering, but now in this holomorphic setting that you don't know what whether to put creation operators first and annihilation operators later. It's a question of order. To leading order in the asymptotics as k tends to infinity. Both work equally well. Um, the reason I wrote this one is because it has more geometric content, okay. as you point out. Yeah. Um, but, but it is also true that if you don't have this, you, that, that, so if you only put H first, so that's some, just a Peplis operator in the uh, 
really in the usual sense, then Baal has, or it's, I think it's anti-leak, I always forget whether it's leak or anti-leak, and it has this positivity condition that if H is positive, the operator is positive or not negative. And if you want to do estimates and stuff, that's more useful. But you always know, because of this leading order behavior that I mentioned, that this is going to be positive plus lower order, and lower, an operator that has a 1 over K in front. So would you prove properties of this guy by means of the other guy, for example? Or? Uh, it, it is possible to prove, to do that, yeah. 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 But since, I mean, all of this is very general, and uh, yeah, but anyway. So the, um, I, 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 uh, I want to mention that the fact that these, that these operators have a nice symbol calculus, like the one I, uh, sorry, I made a mistake here, uh, was, was uh, first appeared in a paper by Bordenmeyer, Leinrank, and, and Schlieffenmeyer in the, what was it, the 80s, right? Uh, I think. And it's based on the theory of, of early 90s. Early 90s. Early 90s. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and it's and it's based on the theory of the proof is based on the theory of um, uh, what to call them Turkish the operators of the Turkish model and uh, They they wrote a book uh, published in the Princeton series uh, in the late seventies, maybe, uh, where they have the what we would I would call the homogeneous version of this, where there is no K. Um, they their their theory applies to symplectic common very generally. Uh, and um, so I'll just say briefly, you have this line bundle, and associated with it, there's a strictly pseudo-convex domain, which is the disk bundle of the dual bundle. And that strictly pseudo-convex domain, well, the boundary has is a circle bundle, so it has an S1 action. And it's, um, it's uh, 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 the space of boundary values of polymorphic functions is is a direct, in an actual way a direct sum of all these guys. And so using that relationship um, and the Butelmon the Gilman theory, one can get that this, uh, this, this, op these operators form an algebra with a simple calculus in the way that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. Yeah, in the, in, in the Euclidean case, so just to make things clear, they, uh, sorry, 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 wait, what's the symbol of these guys? So I, I told you I told you a way to go. Good question. I told you a way to go from H to this uh, this sequence of operators. Um, the symbol of this would be H. To make this into a, an actual algebra, you need to take asymptotic sums of these guys. You know where you have. Uh, um, you know you, you, I I don't want to be too. Um, so you would have this guy. Um, plus a one over k, another guy of, like that, and so on. Okay, and the principal symbol of such a thing, you don't have to start with k to the zero. You would have positive, and and, and the principal symbol of this would be the the lower the Roman h associated to the leading. Does that make sense? So, so basically, all I'm saying is that the symbol of this fellow is is, is this function. And then I have to consider to make it into an algebra. This is this is I, I, I don't mean to say that these, these operators by themselves are closed under composition. That's not true under composition. Say you have to take as symplectic series. Let me just put it like that. Is that anyway, here in this on this slide, I just wanted to say that in the Euclidean case, this 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 whole, the holomorphic sections are essentially this Barton Siegel space, which um, well the way. I understand history, Barton introduced so that the harmonic oscillator, so here you have the, the A, I should call this H, the, the um, harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, becomes a first order operator. Uh, and it's, it's, this is one case where you really, yeah, this is one case where you, you really want to, to, to have the, um, this guy if you want to get the right, if you want to get the one half. <laughs> so it matters which one you pick. Um, okay, so all this is still general. I'm sorry, that maybe I should speed up a little. Um, so the dynamics uh, you have, as I said, in the quantum, on the quantum side, you have Schrodinger's equation, and you know when all goes well, you have a unitary family of, uh, group of, of operators. You can let a depend on t, and then you have a one-parameter family 
of unitary operators. And the classical analog of this is, of course, the Hamilton flow. And when we'd like to, and what has the nice, very nice theorems relating the two in as h bar goes to zero. And more generally, symplectomorphisms ought to correspond to unitary operators. And I'll say more about that later. Okay, so let's move on to, um, this is a very general setting. So I want to talk about Lagrangian wave function. So this is kind of an answer to a question that I put on some other slide. What is a quantum object associated to a Lagrangian function? A Lagrangian, excuse me, a Lagrangian submanifold. Well, so to motivate this, suppose one has a maximal commuting set of quantum observables. So these are operators that commute with each other. And consider a joint eigenfunction. function. Well, so um, by this Poisson uh, relation between commutations and Poisson, then the symbols of these operators, Poisson commute. And let's look at their joint level set, level zero. So, you know, if the Hamilton fields are linearly independent on here, then we all know this is a Lagrangian submanifold, compact, it's a, a connected, it's a torus. And um, that, um, so this submanifold, in a way, is a classical object that is somehow associated to, to this, this joint eigenfunction. So this is, I say this just for now, just that we basically just as a way to, to motivate that a Lagrangian submanifold corresponds to well, this psi would not be unique, but in, in principle, it should correspond to a family, to a family, a line of wave functions satisfying this equation. And so, I, I want to make this a little more precise. If you have a, a function that vanishes, well, let's fix the Lagrangian now, lambda. If you have a function that vanishes on the Lagrangian, then, uh, and the hj's uh, um, also vanish where the differentials are linearly independent, then you can write it in G like this. And so if you imagine now an operator script G that has this symbol applied to this um, imagine uh, uh, this, this, this uh, joint eigen, eigen vector, you'll see that um, you're going to get something that is basically, well, it is small. It is small in h bar. And so these operators <coughs> So the wave function lambda has what is called Lagrangian regularity. So what does that mean? Let's look at the set of all Hamiltonians that vanish on, on lambda. This is closed on the Poisson bracket. This is a, a quick exercise. Uh, and so the symbols uh, here we have we have we have an ideal actually closed on the Poisson commutator uh, on the commutators, excuse me, of function of operators. These are the operators whose symbols vanish here. And the best definition that I know of a Lagrangian wave function is with the Hormander, and it looks like this. Suppose you have an H-dependent family of wave functions that basically are O of 1 as H tends to 0. Then we say that psi is a Lagrangian wave function associated with lambda. Lambda has been fixed. If and only if, for any first order, for any family of first order differential operators whose symbols vanish on lambda, you know, you can you can you can hit psi with any combination of this, and nothing happens in terms of the the decrease. Uh, um, it, it doesn't get any worse. You see, with a first order operator, you would expect this of these functions in general to get worse, meaning bigger in size as h tends to zero. But for Lagrangian wave functions, nothing happens, and this is because of well, I, I tried to move. Oops, this is I tried to motivate it by by this on this slide. Um, and I, 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 well, it's it's a very long story, but one has a simple calculus. What does that mean? I'll explain in a moment. Basically, these guys, you have the Lagrangian, uh, and the Lagrangian wave function has a symbol, which is, in general, a half form or a half density on the la on lambda. So it's a, you know, it's a it's an object that lives on lambda, like a function or a section of a line model. Um, I do have to say that, in general, you cannot have a, 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 a class with a, like this. I mean, you can always ask this condition, but if you want to have a well-defined symbol, um, you need to assume something. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah. The, the symbol there vanishes if you're a multiple of h, right? The symbols of these guys vanish. The symbols of the operators vanish. I'm looking at operators with symbol vanish on lambda. First order. And they are first order, yeah. But you see, in general, you would expect that this 
this is not, I apologize, I, I click and nothing happens, and then I click three times and then three pages. <laughs> <laughs> um, in any case, so, so, yeah, so the P's are first order, so in general you would expect this to be of order uh, one over H, but um, the definition is that psi is a Lagrangian wave function associated with lambda. If for any such operators, you don't get any work. Uh, I yeah so I that's yeah you caught me uh, I there there is metaplectic stuff going on in the back uh, here you can use a half density um, instead you don't need metaplectic for the for the effect. but at some point there will be metaplectic structures that have to be I will so you ignore might it. just assume that there is one. if you like yeah sure. okay. um, in any case um, if if in general, you can kind of do this, but for the simple map to really exist in a good way, globally, you need something called the borsomer felt condition. Uh, and this is all very well explained, nicely and beautifully explained in your book. There's a chapter called Integrality. In it. Uh, and so what, what it says is that if, if you, um, so consider this line bundle, then the full back line bundle is, is flat, the lambda is Lagrangian, and the curvature of L is a symplectic form. Uh, and the Borsonical condition um, ha is that lambda has a global parallel section, unitary, that this one, trivial model, is globally trivial with a unit, uh, auto parallel unitary section. Um, so in the Kelly case, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just be very quick because um, it's the same idea. I mean, I actually, in the previous slides, I didn't say whether we were in a cotangent bond or in the Kähler case. But I do want to emphasize that in the Kähler case, these functions are H-dependent, so they live in different Hilbert spaces, in these, you know, uh, powers of, homomorphic sections of powers of the line bundle. They do, the Kähler case has very nice, um, a very nice feature, which is that the wave functions are functions on phase space. They are, they are already on phase space. Um, and so you can talk about say what happens with their concentration and phase space directly. The, if you have a, such a sequence, you can consider the mod square um, with respect to the remission structure. So this is a, a real function on x. And um, for Lagrangian wave functions associated with, with lambda, they concentrate on lambda. These are, these are, you should think of them as having your Lagrangian, then you should think of a peak. Um, they, they, they are, these functions are rapidly decreasing as k goes to infinity outside of a two-year neighbor of h of actually shrinking radius. Um, so examples, I want to consider example two. I'm going to skip example one. Example two says, take a toric, take a toric um, uh, Kähler manifold, smooth, with mu moment map. And um, take the fiber to be uh, the inverse image, take a fiber of the moment map, uh, with W an in integral regular value. Uh, then associated with this, you have two things. Well, you have the sequence of monomials associated with W. So you see the, the Hilbert spaces of, of X in, in the toy case are generated by these monomials that correspond with integral um, uh, elements of the uh, image of the moment map. I mean, the taking, taking powers of the moment map means that you have to dilate the, the uh, you have to dilate the, uh, the polytope um, multiplied by k. Um, but uh, uh, these are examples. This is a theorem, but these are, are examples of means. Uh, okay. So yeah. get, get, getting ahead of myself, but if I did it at an integral boundary point instead, then yeah. this could be an example for the isotropic case as well. Yes, right? you're absolutely yes. right. Yeah. Yeah. In particular, yeah. In particular, if you take a vertex and you have something called a coherent state. Yes. Which I would, yeah. So anyway, you know, we, uh, Morthwick, um, I and myself have a little, uh, have a paper on, on, on this in the Lagrangian, in the Kähler case. Now, I want to say, um, yeah, so I'm not sure, this remark is kind of a bigger observation, actually. So which Lagrangians would you like to consider? Well, a very important class of Lagrangians are the graphs of canonical transformations. So if you have a lambda, which is a, a graph of a canonical transformation, then you would like to, or one does associate um, 
Lagrangian weight functions, quote unquote. Um, um, so you see here, for, for if you have an oil transformation P from X to X, then the graph, the graph will be will be Lagrangian inside X cross X minus, um, and um, and so and then so here X cross X minus has a bundle that maybe we can call something like that. So a section of this gives you a kernel of kernels of operators from sections of L to sections of L. Um, and so these are the Fourier integral operators, which also can be made sense of in this sort of uh, indicator. Oops, I keep uh, forgetting. Yeah, so what is meant, I, I use, so there's symbol and there's a simple calculus. Symbol calculus means in the Lagrangian case, it means that if I have a Lagrangian wave function and then I have a semi-classical side yaw, uh, or semi-classical observable, then when I apply the semi-classical side yaw to psi, we get another one in the same lambda, and the symbol is just the product of the symbols. Uh, yeah. And furthermore, if the um, the symbol of the, the of the classical observable is zero on lambda. Then you get the degree goes down by one, and then you have an expression um, called the transport equation. You still have an expression for the symbol of a psi, but it's now a derivative, and there is some other stuff that I don't want to talk about. Anyway, that's a quick review of the that's a quick review of the um, of the Lagrangian case. Now, what about the isotropic case? So, isotropic. So manifolds in our definition, you know, is here. Uh, this is joint work with Victor and Zuchin. Um, so um, they are smaller. For its simplest example, is a point. Uh, and uh, and so we can, you know, is there an associated class of wave functions? Well, the simplest example is when you have a single point. Um, now imagine you have a Hamiltonian having that as a non-degenerate minimum. Well, suppose you have a quantum oper operator associated with that. So if you have like a you know, potential well, or you know, I go like this, goes to infinity, the, 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 um, the spectrum of the quantum observable will have a bottom, something like a, as I said, a harmonic oscillator for it's the simplest example. And the ground state, the, 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 the wave function associated to the lowest eigenvalue called the ground state, one can show that it concentrates here. And our natural candidates of these wave functions are associated simply to a point. Um, and in fact, if you, if, you, if you consider all Hamiltonians having x naught as a non-degenerate minimum, you get a class of, of, of wave functions that are called coherent states. Sometimes physicists call them squeeze states for a good reason. Um, so in the, in the Bartman representation, in the Bartman, If you look at the ground state <coughs> of the harmonic oscillator of, um, well, I write the classical Hamiltonian, it's just, um, the way I wrote it, it's just this Gaussian. And so, so you know, it, it concentrates on, on, it concentrates on the origin, but it concentrates on, on round disks. This is the classical coherent state and the basic coherent state of the environment space. But physicists are fond of considering other types, um, which are sometimes called squeeze states. You have a different quadratic form. Um, so the, the, the idea is that this concentration, the uncertainty principle, holds. Um, this is a minimum for uncertainty principle for P and Q. And here you are squeezing. So this somehow is more concentrated, you know, this is more, the state is more concentrated in this direction than it is in this direction. And so on, of course, we um, In any case, uh, let's see, I, I, I should, yeah. So there is a way to generalize this notion of Lagrangian regularity to the isotropic case. Uh, so it's now important to consider not only functions that vanish on lambda, but we have to add the condition that the Hamilton field is tangent to, 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 sorry, this should have been a sigma. This is a typo. 
Sigma represents an isotropic initial in sigma. So, you know, in the Lagrangian case, if you have a function that is constant on a Lagrangian, its Hamilton field will be tangent to the Lagrangian. Here, in the isotropic case, that's no longer the case. The Hamilton field will be a section of the symplectic annihilator, which is, which is bigger. But if we add by hand the condition that psi h get a tan is tangent to sigma, you impose that as a conditional condition, then you get an ideal in C infinity with a Poisson bracket. And we can define <coughs> the set of uh, isotropic wave functions in this Kormander way, just as before, and it's an intrinsic definition. And so um, what kind of wave function we get, and is there a simple calculus? Um, and um, well, so in the model case of the Euclidean case, um, um, we have a model in the Euclidean case which is very simple. Maybe I should have to look at the time. I don't want to, um, I don't want to have enough time for Maybe I skip the model case, actually. Um, um, maybe I don't skip the model case. So, so let's just take R2. This is going to be x is equal to In this model case, it's just x is equal to tangent base of R2. I, I'm just going to write down the, um, the wave function that we consider. I think they're on the next page. You see, the simplest ones are functions of t and u of the root h. Um, where, so these are these are the these are the functions. These are the sides. Where, um, where, um, for every t, psi is a Schwarz function in the second entry. So it's rapidly decreasing. So I just want to give you a sense with this simple model, what is happening is that these functions are, are you know, we're dividing by h bar. So um, uh, when u is 0, this doesn't decay at all. But when u is a little bit positive, different from 0, this will decay by the Schwarz condition. So these, these wave functions are concentrated on t. When u equals 0, they concentrate. On, on u equals zero, as h tends to as h tends to zero. Those have symbol a zero. Or Those have symbol a zero. So the symbol the symbol of what this thing is going to be a zero. So I'm sorry. The symbol of this is going to be a zero of t dot. Okay. So they are t dependent Schwartz functions. This is a this is a, a, a model case. Um, yeah. Anyway, you can work out looking at the time. You can work out the the operators that generate. So the sigma naught, the, the the model case is here. So u equals zero. It's a equitangent model. So it's a subset of the zero section. Little variables found mu. It's in the zero section with u equals zero. And one can figure out what these functions, what functions generate the, the ideal. Uh, and basically, the operators in, 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 in question are these. Now that this is of order 1, there is no h bar. Q is a quadratic function. Uh, and uh, there's a 1 over h bar in front and h bar in the So these are the operators that generate this ideal. Um, so uh, yeah, so here's I already said some of this. Can't forget this top part. The the the, the squeezed example. Can I point all the way there? This is right. That thing is uh, in environment spaces of this form. So you have this quadratic form in Z in front of the standard. Um, anyway, uh, so simple calculus of isotropic wave functions. The good news is that as these wave functions do have a single calculus. The bad news is that this is quite subtle. They are symplectic spinners. Um, and, uh, but what I'm about to tell you is with this whole thing is really the semi-classical version for the Hermite distributions of the thermal value element that I already mentioned. Um, so symbols of uh, Lagrangian wave functions are sections of a line bundle. Uh, they have density bundle. 
uh, symbols of isotropic wave functions are sections of an infinite rank bundle. So what are these? I, I, I want to describe to you what this rank, infinite rank bundle is. A key object in the construction of this is the symplectic normal bundle of sigma, which by definition is this. At every point in sigma, you take the quotient of the annihilator to the tangent space by the tangent space. Uh, and so you get, you get a, a, a symplectic vector space at each point, which makes a bundle. Uh, and it's called the symplectic normal bundle. And we do need some metaplectic structure. So if you had a metaplectic structure with manifold from the in, beginning, does you get one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is not, yeah. So the um, yeah. So the what we have to do is for each fiber, we have to make we have to somehow construct a, a or find a space where these Schwarz functions live in the in the uh, in the manifold case in the general case. Um, and so for that, I I need to discuss the abstract Hilbert space of an MT vector space. So this is a little bit of um, detail. So what I, what I claim is that, so I do need an eclectic structure, I claim that it has an associated abstract Hilbert space where the Schrodinger representation of the Schrodinger group of E is realized. So how is this? Well, so <clears throat> it's a very nice um, piece of mathematics. You take a symplectic, well, take a metaplectic space. Uh, I claim that each Lagrangian subspace defines a Hilbert space. So a, 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 a wave function. So how does that go? Um, well, I'm going to wave my hands a little bit, of course. But if you have if you have this vector space, um, and you have you have a you have a, a, a solid e, and you have a Lagrangian of manifold, then the Lagrange, by parallel tra by translating it, it translates, um, give you a real a real polarization. Uh, that's L. This is the this one to the origin is L, but I get a, a whole polarization. And so uh, using that polarization, the elements in this Hilbert space HL consist of um, sections of a pre quantum line bundle co covariant constant with respect to this polarization. And um, uh, but you have to you have, so they're 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 constant, they're functions that are constant here. To get the to get the um, the uh, the Hilbert space, you need to integrate over the quotient, and so so in fact you need to the thing to do is to to take these sections that are constant like this and tensor with a transverse half form, so it's a transverse piece that allows you to integrate um, uh, intrinsically as part of the object. And this construction is, is covariant. If you have an MP map, then um, just push forward gives you a map, unitary map from HL to HG dot L. Now, what we need for this intrinsic uh, space is the Blattner constant stern repairing, which in this case is a particularly nice, takes a particularly nice form. It generally is a pairing. If you have two different polarizations, the pairing gives, well, gives you a bilinear form on the, test, on the product of the Hilbert spaces. In this case, it's actually given by a unitary map. The BKS pairing is a unitary map from, if you have two Lagrangians, you can go from one to the other by this BKS pairing. If you have, um, if you take L to be P equals zero and L prime to be X equals zero, then this is the Fourier transform. In general, it's a partial Fourier transform. I think of it as a partial Fourier transform. And now you can simply make a space consisting of uh, equivalent classes consisting of a pair of a Lagrangian and an element in its Hilbert space quotient out by this canonical this equivalence relation, which is given by this um, you know equivalence under the PKS term. And then you can do something interesting. Uh, in addition, you can you can for if you have an MP map, you can as I said you can go from HL to HGL. And now the DKS map allows you to go back to HL. So you get a map from HL to itself for each G. And it turns out that this is a metaplectic representation. And well, as I, this abstract space carries the Heisenberg representation of the Heisenberg group. So what we, what we proved in a paper that already appeared um, 
last year is that this is that the um, it's it's in yeah that the um, we set up the theory to show that there is an actual well-defined symbol. So what do we do for the symbol? Um, well, you, let's go back to the symplectic normal. So at every point in sigma, you have this vector space, symplectic vector space. You have its uh, abstract Hilbert space. You take these smooth vectors there with respect to the um, Heisenberg representation. So that's the analog. That's exactly the Schwartz function that you want. And the symbol of this, so at each point, you have this space of Schwartz functions that is intrinsic to the object. And then you also need a tangential part, which is a half, a half form. And this has already been mentioned, that if you have something like this, it's just good. So, um, well, there's a simple calculus. Uh, it's, more, it's more, well, the first part is just as important. If you hit upside by a quantum observable, and you get another one. N is the degree here, the order in each bar. Uh, and, uh, and the symbol is just the product. You can point wise multiply. Now, if A sigma is 0, then, so, uh, uh, yeah, so the, in this calculus, things go down by a half, not by integers. So you need half powers of, of H bar. Uh, and, uh, and then you can ask, so, yeah, so if the principal symbol of A, the observable, is 0, then go down by 1 half. And you can ask, what is the symbol of that? Well, the Hamilton field is, is at each point on sigma is in the symplectic orthogonal. Therefore, it defines a section of the symplectic normal bundle. And therefore, it's, you can think of, uh, sorry, you can think of this psi A as an element in the V algorithm of the Heisenberg group at that point. Every point, every vector space has its own. And you can let that act on the symbol of sigma, and that's the, that's the answer. Um, but what about if <clears throat> so this this is terrible. It, it, this was defined about 20 slides ago. <laughs> this simply means that a respect to sigma is zero, and psi a is tangent to sigma. Therefore, this this section that I talk about here is zero. So then, what happens is that you go down by another half. So now you're down back to one to a minus one, and it simply is a kind of derivative that I don't want to go into. And so you see, this is in complete agreement with the uh, regularity that I mentioned. It's, uh, this is if A, sorry, all this is if A is of order 0. If A were of order 1, then um, this A minus 1 would be N again. And you're in the same class as before if A is of order 1 and has this property. So you will read, if this is in complete agreement with the regularity that we. So, so when you say, <coughs> sorry, when you say calculus, what it means is you have this class of functions. Yes. And then you apply this uh, sort of differential operator. Yes. Kind of, you know how the symbol changes. Yes. And sort of maybe statement two or three, it's something about there are no derivatives in mu, mu, or just a few derivatives. Like these conditions about the tangents yes. just tell you that kind of higher order terms derivative in, in the use and yes. the other vanish. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I follow. This, this tells you what you said. A moment, a moment ago. You, this tells you what the symbol is. In yeah, case. I just don't know what the Heisenberg action means. Ah, uh, yeah. I guess. Um, so, so you know, symplectic vector space has Heisenberg group associated with it. The Lie algebra is the vector space itself tensor with R. And so, I can think of this this section of this at each point, psi defines an element in the Lie algebra of that group. And, and that acts on the Schwartz functions at that point. Okay. Um, so anyway, we have applications. I'm going to skip application one. Well, actually, it's very nice. But I'm going to skip it. Because um, I want to, yeah, well, maybe I should say something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so this application um, is in the you can do this both in the killer and the L2 um, setting, potential model setting. It allows you it allows you to construct so-called quasi modes. Yeah, this is um, I, I really would like to skip this um, the detail, but essentially, you if you have a complex value Hamiltonian with certain properties, then you can construct solutions to this eigenvalue this eigenvalue problem mod all H infinity. So you're solving basically this is what we're solving symbolically. Um, 
in some equation model h infinity. But the very nice thing about this, this is a, 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 a it has been proved before, but um, in both settings, in the cotangent bundle setting and in the Taylor setting. But what is very nice is that now it has a very, very short proof because you can do this symbolically. You look for the so-called quasi, quasi state, the quasi mode, um, symbolically. And because we have all these invariants, we can take any model of the of the Heisenberg representation, because we are going to apply the first transport equation. So you can get any model that we want. Um, and the model that we that we can take is say for this this one, this very simple model where um, one can show that um, well it has to be many more dimensions more more anyway, we can we can take this model and um, do calculations that are very elementary at the single level and then uh, it's very quick a very quick proof of that. But I wanted to talk about this mixed states that we were discussing prior. Yeah, the, no. the, the philosophy of the previous slide is just that I can kind of take test functions on a point, you know? Like instead of now, now that you have the entropic calculus, I can just like concentrate on a point. I can just study the sheep the sorry, the, the guys which are concentrated yes. there. And then you're done with that. Yes, I can, I can I can work on Euclidean space. I can I can I can take um, I can take a model of the so I'm sorry, I can uh, in, in this problem, x naught is a point. So the symplectic normal is entire tangent space um, um, to x, and so I can take, you know, I can think that I'm in R2n, uh, and and then the symbol computation becomes a symbol computation in the ordinary um, uh, Heisenberg group. You have, you know, it's, it's a first order equation. You have to show that certain certain operator. Has surge, is surjective from Schwartz functions to Schwartz functions because you're going to apply the uh, the transport equation several times, infinitely many times, but you also need that it has a kernel. So you have some sort of again the ground state, and then you make corrections. Like I, I can tell you later in, in detail, but it's basically the, the point of this slide is that now that we've done all this work, uh, we can then solve this problem by doing simple computation. Of Um, so this is something that we were talking about on Friday. It's uh, right. Yes. <laughs> um, maybe it was Saturday. So um, it, this is an interesting uh, new direction for for, for me. Um, so let's take any sort of manifold now. It doesn't have to be anything in particular. Although in most cases it might take into the Lagrangian. Um, and you can form this. So these Z's are coherent states at points on gamma. You choose coherent states. And this is the projector of a coherent state. And then you take the sum of projectors to respect to some density one. So these are, you take, you know, you take, a, take a curve. So you, you can do this already in, in case x equals c. It's interesting you take a curve. And then um, you project. At each point, you consider the projection of, onto the coherent state with that center, the little Gaussian there, and then you integrate. What you get is something called a mixed state. So I told you that pure states were rays. So these are projections onto rays. This, each one of these projections is a pure state, but we're taking a sum of them. Um, and so this is called the resulting operator. It's an integral of projection. It's called a coherent. It's called a mixed state. The definition of a mixed state is simply that it's an operator that is not negative. It's Hermitian non-negative and has trace equal to one. Uh, and basically, this tells you don't know exactly what state you're in. You're in a superposition of all these possible coherent states. Uh, and uh, so. Um, I, 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 I hope I have your permission to call this a theorem. We haven't written it down, but then if, if everything if it doesn't work, then you can only blame me. And <laughs> leave my goal for society. I'm, I'm confident this this the short kernel of this is is an operator uh, in the class in a class uh, in a mid class where where the isotropy is just a diagonal on this gamma. Um, and I, I um, well, I'm pretty sure that we can prove all these theorems symbolically. This theorem has already been proved by the Laughlin in a re recent preprint. 
Um, but we can do things more like that, other things like plant evolution as well. So anyway, this, all this is in, in progress. Yeah, so coda. So I didn't write anything on the coda because I, I wanted to just sort of say some general, general, make some general remarks. So you, I've, I've talked about semi-classical analysis on, with, I guess I emphasize, Kähler variables and space spaces. Um, one can wonder what this, whether this has uh, uh, connections with football hard symplectic geometry, symplectic topology. And um, actually, last May, right in, in Tel Aviv, there was a, a, a workshop dedicated to this. And I, I want to say that this is very, very interesting uh, stuff. So um, I, I cannot give details because I haven't absorbed it completely, but there is a paper by um, Laurent Sharp and Leonid Poterovich where they, they, they look at something called dislocation. This is in the, in the spirit of, of, of um, displaceability, whether you can displace a Lagrangian or not. And, uh, and so what they looked at is, is, is how much energy does it take to displace a Lagrangian in both in the classical way and in the quantum way. For the quantum, to measure how much energy is, 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 is to define its visibility in the quantum world, they use something called um, uh, fidelity, which we're trying to understand. Um, and they so, so, have. So the definition of quantum size is this new? Is this theirs or is this? So they take they take uh, they take uh, uh, a quantum. As far as I understand it, they they take a Lagrangian wave function. They want to displace it away from itself. One of these mixed states, actually, they want to displace it away from itself. And what that means in the quantum world is measured by something called fidelity, and they are they are. Um, they compare the, they, they compare the energy required to obtain a certain lack of fidelity, a certain amount of displacement in the quantum world with, with classical but, energy. But the definition is not new. What definition? Fidelity. Well, I didn't define the fidelity. No. I don't want to define fidelity. No, I'm not asking. Actually, no. You, I'm just asking. Is this something that they defined, or is this something that people have? Fidelity is something that comes from quantum the information theory, as I was saying. No. It's something they. Well, I mean, it's existed. It's existed. But it's like, it, but it plays a key role in this paper. Yeah. And, and the, of course, uh, classically, displaceability means you can find a sort of a Hamiltonian flow that takes you from your Lagrangian to a Lagrangian that doesn't intersect. So, I, I should say that. Now you can sort of quantize that. Both classically, quantum mechanically, but quantum mechanically, what you're trying to do is you're, you're, you're taking. Um, Quantum analog and applying unit, a family of unitary operators to it, so that, and um, well, the inner product of the thing you started with and the transposed thing, the small, small mean OH and um, It can compare in small, but in the zero or something. You don't yeah. send it to something that's perpendicular to it? Um, is perpendicular modulo OH infinity. Uh, it's, it's all based on the existence of the uh, H, H world uh, as a measure of small. Another, another observation in that direction that, uh, that I made is that you see there's something called, and this would be the subject of another talk, I guess, it is, uh, this, there's something called a Woodfield trace formula that relates um, the spectrum of quantum observables to periodic trajectories of their symbol. Um, and I always had a feeling, and I'd be able to, I, I, I would be happy to explain this to anyone in private later, um, that there's a connection between that and the whole resender capacity. Um, and uh, basically, you see, my, my, my feeling is that in the trace formula, the trace formula, which is a bit complicated, it, it tells you how eigenvalues are distributed. Um, and in a sense that I cannot make precise where I would be speaking about it, the, the first, the shortest geodesic, the, for, the shortest periodic trajectory of the, point of the classical Hamiltonian tells you how, uh, gives you a constraint on how evenly you can space your eigenvalues. I wish I could make this a theorem. Uh, I hope I will someday. Um, and so, um, you know, the, the, the trace formula has a part that is 
that is nice like a Poisson summation formula. You see, think of the Poisson summation formula. You detect for a lattice, you detect the shortest, the shortest periodic geodesic on a torus. You can detect that spectrally. Uh, and the Gutzwiller trace formula allows you to do this in general. So I think that has relations with capacity as well. Uh, and uh, I would like to ask if anybody knows whether this covariance capacity of a toric manifold is a diameter of the moment polytron. Because that that would be a useful thing for me. Should be one easy direction. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I. I, I, I so, so the, fir the first question you would ask is whether different toric actions on the same symplectic manifold. Yes. Be no, no. Yeah, yeah. Wait, but it's not quite. It can't. Qu I mean, uh, unless we don't have the same notion of diameter. Uh, well, you need to have some rational. No, no. But even I mean, if you take a product of S twos, it's going to be the smallest one that determines the overall center capacity. And uh -huh. Diameter, I think, would be the largest one, right? Oh. Sorry. Maybe it's the other way around. Oh, oh, yeah, not the, not the diameter. It's not the diameter, it's kind of the other way around. <laughs> okay. And beyond that, but the first, and beyond the first that thing we don't would know. be to look at different actions of the yeah, same okay. manifold and see if they have the same way. But and it would be like, it would, it's more likely to be the one over diameter. Of one over I mean, you know, the radius of whatever the. Yeah, right. And I think they will. <laughs> <laughs> So I, um, I think we actually had our questions section. And, and so I, it remains for us to thank the speaker. So the council will be talking actually now in 25 minutes about So again, as I said, I'm not going to 